Thank you so much. It's a privilege to be here at Prince Street with you this morning. I uh, had the great privilege of working with Pastor John a number of years, seven years at King Street and King Street Church in Chambersburg. I um, also was honored to be able to officiate John and Amanda's wedding and to dedicate Isaac to the Lord. And so it's a, it's a blessing to be here. You're, you're blessed with, with John. He He's very concerned about me showing up here. He texted me even this morning to remind me, thank you so much for preaching today. And I talked to him yesterday, so I guess he thought I might forget showing up here this morning. He was very concerned about that because he thanked me three times. And this morning's was more of a thank you, I'm reminding you. So recently I was at a birthday party for a five-year-old relative, and she received from her grandparents what I, I think most children perceive as the dreaded gift. What do most children perceive as the dreaded gift? Clothing, right? I mean, she, she opened up the box and she took out a top and she threw it to the left and then she pulled out a, a pair of pants and she threw them to the right and she took the box and she dumped it upside down. She said, where's the gift? And when her, her parents, uh, who were very embarrassed at this point, said, That's, those are the gifts, the gifts that right there that you threw to the left and the right. I don't know how to describe the look on her face, just this, the lack of appreciation and gratitude that came, uh, misunderstanding what this was all about. It can be funny, it can be kind of cute when children respond that way. It's not so funny when uh, folks that are older don't show gratitude and don't appreciate what they've been given. In the mid-1980s, my wife and I, Anne, served in Newark, New Jersey for a number of years in a, a small urban church in youth ministry. And one of the things it seemed as if many people in our church did quite a bit was change their residence. They moved a lot. And I think that was related to poverty and, and uh, being poor in the city. And since the church owned a van and I drove the van, I was asked to help move quite a few people over those years. One particular family moved three times in one year. And I can still remember the third time that we moved, I arrived at their apartment at the agreed upon time of eight o'clock in the morning. I'll let you in on a little secret. If you arrive at someone's house to help them move and they're not out of bed yet, you, that's, that's a bad sign, right? So I arrive and I'm knocking on the door and, and uh, there was a dad and a mom and three kids. They got up. They didn't have a lot. We, we took bags and boxes and, and things weren't even packed and we packed all these things up and I had told them I had a, just a couple of hours to help, and they said, no problem. Well, by now, it's almost noon, and we're just getting in the van. And then we proceeded to drive around the city of Newark at least for two hours, looking for the apartment that the, the, the father couldn't remember where it was. So we're driving all over the city looking for this apartment. We arrive finally at this apartment, and now it's close to two, two, three he instantly takes off. He had, a, he had a drinking problem. He took off. So now I'm left with mom, three young kids, and we're unloading everything. It's close to five. This is way before cell phones. They didn't have a phone and had no idea where I was. I told her I'd be home at noon. It's probably five, six o'clock. And I said, when we finally got everything done, hey, I'm leaving. And they said, okay, see ya. <laughs> And I would be less than honest if I told you that by not receiving a thank you, that was painful. I would be less than honest if I told you that. It was painful not to receive a thank you because I kind of felt flung to the left and the right by that experience. Now, I'm sure all of us have stories like this, and I'm sure if we're honest, all of us probably have done this more than it's been done to us. I mean, have we really thanked the people in our lives who blessed us as we should? I, I was thinking about this as I was preparing this message. I thought about teachers. I thought about my family. I thought about friends. I thought about coworkers. Have I really expressed the gratitude to them that they deserve for what they've done and what they've given to me? And I'm sure that my lack of gratitude has caused pain in people's lives. It's always intrigued me how we often wait until someone's died before we say how much we appreciate them. Have you ever noticed that? Uh, you know, we, we come to the funeral and we express our appreciation so much for these people's lives. Why is that? Why are we so slow to express our gratitude? What, what is it that keeps us from being thankful? I read a study that according to the U.S. Department of Labor, 
the number one reason people leave their jobs, the number one reason is because they don't feel appreciated. An astonishing, one poll said, an astonishing 65% of Americans reported receiving no recognition for good work in the past year. Why, why is that? What, what, what's, the, what's the root of that? One reason I, I believe is because we live in a country and in a culture of such abundance, don't we? And it's, it becomes easy to take things for granted. It really does. I, I know in my own life, we're, we're good takers in America. We are. We're, we're, we're good at that. Uh, uh, here's another factor that I see in myself, and I think I see in others too. It's the belief that we deserve so much of what we receive, that we, we almost treat what we have and what we receive as a right. And both of these both of these reasons for our lack of gratitude find their root, I believe, in our selfishness, our sinfulness, our, our self-centeredness. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes these words in, oh, there's none back there. Okay, I'm going to have to read it off the side. I'm going to have to move forward so I can see this. Okay, <laughs> I'm used to seeing the words back there too. I'm sorry to move this flower, whoever put it here, but thank you for doing that. Paul writes these words. For although they knew God, and he's talking about the fall into sin. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And Francis Schaeffer, great theologian, uh, the founder of Labrie, in his commentary on this text says this, This is the central point. They were not thankful. Instead of giving thanks, they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And I was so struck by this statement. The beginning of our rebellion against God was and is the lack of a thankful heart. The beginning of our rebellion against God was and it is on the screen in the back. Thank you for that. I'll put the flower back then, I promise. The beginning of our rebellion against God was and is the lack of a thankful heart. And those of us in the church, in the body of Christ, aren't, immune to this, are we? In fact, not only do we often fall short in expressing our thankfulness for each other, I think particularly we fall even shorter when it comes to our relationship with the Lord. Our text for this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Now on his way, Jesus, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him, and they stood at a distance, and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. And he threw himself at Jesus' feet, and he thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. The word of the Lord. Don't miss how this story begins. Verse 11 says that Jesus was traveling along the border between Samaria and Galilee along the border. He was in the borderlands. He was in the place where people, one definition of borderlands, an unclear state or condition where people are lost, looking for a home. Borderlands can be a mental state, can be an actual place, can be a condition of our hearts. It's a powerful image for where the church, the body of Christ, needs to place itself. We should be, in a sense, in the borderlands, in a place, Samaria and Galilee, They hated each other, Samaritans and Galileans. They hated each other. Right in the middle, Jesus is walking as an agent of reconciliation. It's a powerful image for us in the church. As Jesus enters a village, we have this emotionally moving scene where ten men afflicted with leprosy meet him. And it says, at a distance, we're told, which probably was a sign of humility as much as it's a result of their condition. And they call out to him in loud voices. They cry out loud, Jesus, Master, have mercy. Have mercy. Master, have mercy. 
That's a sad scene, isn't it? That's a powerful prayer. It's it's an amazing prayer. It's a prayer that recognizes the two greatest truths, I believe, about the person of Jesus Christ. That He's Master, that He's Lord, He's powerful, and that He's merciful. Is there ever a moment in our lives where we don't need a merciful Master in our lives? This is a prayer for every moment of every day. Because there's not one second we're not in need of the mercy, of the undeserved favor of the Master Jesus Christ. As we all know, leprosy is such a terrible disease. It was the Ebola of its day. Uh, No cure, considered contagious, resulted in horrific disfigurement. If you've ever seen a person with full-blown leprosy, it can turn your stomach. Uh, the, uh, the resulting disfigurement is just, it's horrible. Social isolation, you were deemed cursed by God. Literally with lepers, what they would do is they would pronounce burial rites over them. You're dead in the eyes of the world. Cut off emotionally, physically, spiritually. And even though leprosy still exists in our world today, we, we don't see it here in the United States of America. There's a few cases. We don't hear much about this. And yet, I would contend that there are many people who feel emotionally what lepers felt, who feel cut off, who feel ostracized, who feel judged, who feel isolated, abandoned. I think there are many people like that in our culture. Maybe many of the people you serve in your community meal, in your ministry. Why did these ten men cry out for mercy? because they were expected to isolate themselves and avoid interaction. So why did they do that? Why did they reach out to Jesus? Maybe they heard stories about Jesus and other lepers, right? Maybe they heard that. Maybe they heard about how Jesus touched lepers, and that encouraged them. Maybe the presence of Jesus in the borderlands gave them hope. The fact that he placed himself in that context where they... In the midst of their suffering, he walked in the midst of their suffering, just as he does with us. Maybe they sensed this wonderful truth about Jesus, that he could never pass by people in need. When you read the Gospels, you see that, right? He just can't pass by people in need. I love that about Jesus. Maybe it was the sense that Jesus was approachable, that he was approachable. I was thinking about that. I never felt that way about Jesus growing up. I grew up in the context of a church. Um, I didn't meet the Lord until I was 21 years old. I never had the sense that God was approachable. God felt distant to me. Pastors wore robes. People in church didn't seem authentic to me. I'm not saying they weren't, but it just didn't seem that way. As a child and as a teenager, I could never have imagined Jesus hanging out with me and my friends, right? riding a bike, uh, throwing pumpkins, which he probably wouldn't have done, but uh, but you know, just I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine that. But but by the grace of God, I encountered the real Jesus at the age of 21. And one of my first emotional responses to the person of Jesus Christ, to the Jesus of the New Testament, was a sense of relief that I could be myself, that I could be myself in His presence, that that He accepted me as I was, and His transformation work was gentle and powerful in my life. And I wonder if the the lepers knew this that day about Jesus as they cry out to him, that he was approachable. Jesus instructs them, go show yourselves to the priests, which doesn't make much sense to us, but in that culture, if you had a skin disease and you were cut off, the only person that could say you were clean was the priest. The priest was the the, um, CDC. The priest was the, 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 the people who pronounced healing, physical healing. So In a sense, what Jesus is saying, the the lepers realize that Jesus is speaking a word of healing here. He's speaking, go show yourselves to the priests. That's a word of healing. And instantly they take off. They they obey him, which is astounding when you really think about it, that they just begin to run to the priest when Jesus speaks those words. It shows how much authority Jesus spoke with. It shows how much they trusted him. And you might say, well, they were desperate. That's why they did that. And if that's true, then I pray, Lord, make me desperate like that. Make me desperate to obey Jesus, whatever he says, to instantly respond. And look what happens. The scripture says that as they went, they were healed. One author 
describes it this way. He says they're off, running, running, amazed to be running. They feel a surge and a tingle in bones and flesh that had long been dead like sticks. A dizzying, headlong flood of strength, burning and washing all at once. They could run like this all day. They look down, each of them, and see what they had wanted for so long and so badly that they've been almost afraid to hope for. Hands and feet whose flesh was once cracked and stubbed and ashen now has a ruddy smoothness, a wholeness. One counts his toes, ten, all ten. Another brushes the tips of his fingers together and thrills at the sensation that flits down his nerves. One steps on something, sharp, cutting, and laughs because he felt that. And they keep running. It's a great picture. Imagine their emotions. They are being made clean and whole as they run. Imagine that. The only thought in their mind is, when I get to the priest, the priest says you're clean, and then I can be restored to the community. Maybe I can go back to my family. I, 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 can, I can hug and be hugged. I can't wait to go home. They've been set free. They were dead, and now they're alive. But one stops, one of the ten, while the others run on. And the Scripture says he turns and he heads back to Jesus. And he praises God and he throws himself at the feet of Jesus and he thanks Him. It's a powerful scene, isn't it? It's moving. And Jesus asks him a, a telling question, a question that reveals how much Jesus notices. Jesus says, weren't there ten? Where are the other nine? What do you hear in that question? I hear a little bit of hurt in that question. Where are the other nine? Are you the only one? And then Jesus says, this man is a Samaritan, which is, which is an implication that maybe the other nine were, were Jews, the people of God. Where are the other nine? Maybe Jesus was thinking this, why are we so quick to receive the gift and not to thank the giver of the gift? I see that in my life. Now, you might say, well, the other nine did exactly what Jesus told them to do, and that's true, because we can't force gratitude. You can't command thankfulness. It doesn't work. It's a choice that we make. It's an act of the heart. It's a response to the recognition that we deserve nothing, that grace isn't a right, that every good thing we have is a gift of God who's compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in love. He's abounding in love. The Apostle Paul writes these words in Colossians, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And then to the Thessalonians, he says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ. And I love this from Colossians. So then, just as you received Christ, Jesus as Lord, continue to live your life in Him, your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and then the height of maturity, overflowing with thankfulness, overflowing with gratitude. I love that image. Would that we, individually and corporately, would that we would be people who overflow with grateful and thankful hearts. Don't you want that for yourself? I want that to be true for me. I want to be a person who lives thankfully. I read a quote by Morris West recently who said, at the, at the end of your life, you basically should have three phrases. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> now to cultivate this grateful heart is hard work in an ungrateful world, in a world that flings to the left and the right the gifts of God. If we want to be people who overflow with gratitude, we have to continually remind ourselves of where we've been and where we would be apart from the grace of Jesus Christ. Right? We need to remind ourselves of that. I love this passage. I think it's one of the best passages for showing just where we, we've been and where we would be. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. We were by nature objects of wrath, but because of God's great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in sin. It's by grace you've been saved. That's an amen statement there, isn't it? 
there. To cultivate gratefulness, we must remember our sin, leprosy, and the undeserved favor of God. God forbid, God forbid that we should hurt the Savior's heart by our lack of gratitude. God forbid that at the end of the day, the Lord would say, where are the other nine? Where's Don Baker? Look what I did for him today. Look at the grace I poured into his life. Look at the mercy, the protection, and the provision. And he hasn't thanked me yet. God forbid. In this story, the Lord receives thanks for 10% of his blessings. Right? One out of 10. One out of the 10 lepers. And I wonder if that's true in my life. If, I wonder if I even thank him for 10% of his blessings in my life. Mark Buchanan, in his uh, pastor, Mark Buchanan, author in his book, Holy Wild, shares a story from a time when he was in Uganda. He says this, in a little dirt floor church one Sunday evening, the village pastor asked if anyone had anything they wanted to share. And he said, a tall, skinny African woman from the back danced to the front. Oh, brothers and sisters, I love Jesus so much, she said. Tell us, sister, tell us, the Ugandans shouted back. Oh, I love him so much. I don't even know where to begin. He's so good to me. Where do I begin to tell you how good he is to me? Begin there, sister. Begin right there. Oh, she said, he's so good. I praise him all the time for how good he is. For three months, I prayed to him for shoes. And look, and with that, the woman cocked up her leg so that we could see one foot, one very ordinary shoe covered it. He gave me shoes. The Ugandans went wild. They clapped, they cheered, they whistled, they yelled. But not me, Mark writes. I was devastated. I sat there broken and grieving. In an instant, God snapped me out of my self-pity and plunged me into repentance. In all my life, I had not once prayed for shoes. It never even crossed my mind. And in all my life, I had not even once thanked God for the many, many shoes I had. Hmm. If you don't do it already, can I encourage you even today, to begin um, a thankful list. That's just a list where you write down things you're thankful for. People, provision, God's blessings. It can be very simple. You keep a thankful list in your Bible and you just, just add to it each day. Something, someone. If you don't know where to start, maybe just put shoes for the first thing. And if someone makes that list, I always encourage folks, Tell them. Tell them you're on your thankful list. The reformer Martin Luther was once asked for a simple definition of worship. His definition was this. Worship is one leper returning. One leper returning. Jesus says in verse 19 to this one leper, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you whole. Ten lepers were healed physically that day. But only one, I believe, experienced the deeper healing, the soul healing. And, and I believe that healing was the result of his gratitude. I believe that gratitude opened the door to deeper healing. I think it still does. I think our gratitude opens the door to God's deeper healing in our lives. Now, I'm sure in any gathering of people, there's somebody who's thinking this. If you knew what I'm dealing with, if you knew the suffering, if you knew the pain, you wouldn't be so quick to talk about being thankful. And if that's where you are, please know, I would never ask you to fake it. Jesus also says, blessed are those who mourn. But if that is where you are, may I be so bold as to challenge you and to remind you that even in the darkness, we still have choices to make. Baptist pastor John Claypool says that in every situation, there are two questions we can ask, a resentment question or a gratitude question. The resentment, the resentment question is this, why did this have to happen to me? The gratitude question is, what is there here to be thankful for that can be used in constructing a new future? John Claypool doesn't make these points from an academic ivory tower. He writes out of the crucible of personal suffering and grief at the tender age of Ten, his daughter, Laura Lou, died of acute leukemia. And in the days following her death, Claypool was overwhelmed with bitterness and anger. But eventually he chose not to continue down that path. And he writes these words. 
Who was Laura Lou really? She had been a gift, not something I created and therefore had a right to clutch as an owned possession, but a treasure who had always belonged to another. She had been with me solely through the gracious generosity of that one. And then he says this, at every given juncture, we humans are given the freedom to choose the attitudes we assume. And so it was with me. I could be angry that Laura Lou had died after only 10 short years. Or I could be grateful that she had lived at all and that I had been able to share in her wonder. And he says this, I chose then and I still do the way of gratitude. I want to close with a story that Max Lucado, maybe it's familiar to you, to you it's worth hearing, uh, shares in one of his books. He says, an old man walks down a Florida beach. The sun sets like an orange ball on the horizon. The waves slap the sand. The smell of salt water stings the air. The beach is vacant. No sun to entice sunbathers. No, not enough light for the fishermen. So aside from a few joggers and strollers, the gentleman is alone. He carries a bucket in his bony hand, a bucket of shrimp. It's not for him. It's not for the fish. It's for the seagulls. He walks to an isolated pier cast in gold by the setting sun. He steps out to the end of the pier. The time has come for his weekly ritual. He stands and waits. Soon, the sky becomes a mass of dancing dots. The evening silence gives way to the screeching of birds. They fill the air. They cover the moorings. They are on a pilgrimage to meet the old man. For a half hour or so, the bushy-browed, shoulder-bent gentleman would stand on the pier, surrounded by the birds of the sea until his bucket is empty. The old man on the pier couldn't go a week without saying thank you. His name was Eddie Rickenbacker. If you were alive in October of 1942, you probably remember the day that he was reported missing at sea. He had been sent on a mission to deliver a message to General Douglas MacArthur. With a hand-picked crew and a B-17 known as the Flying Fortress, he set off across the South Pacific. Somewhere the crew became lost, the fuel ran out, the plane went down. All eight crew members escaped into life rafts. They battled the weather, the water, the sharks, the sun. But most of all, they battled the hunger. After eight days, their rations were gone. They ran out of options. It would take a miracle for them to survive. And a miracle occurred. After an afternoon devotional service, the men said a prayer and tried to rest. As Rickenbacker was dozing with his hat over his eyes, something landed on his head. He would later say, that he knew it was a seagull. <laughs> he didn't know how, he just knew. That gall meant food, if he could catch it, and he did. The flesh was eaten, the intestines were used as fish bait, the crew survived. What was a seagull doing hundreds of miles away from land? Only God knows. For whatever reason, Rickenbacker was thankful. As a result, every Friday, this old captain walked to the pier, his bucket full of shrimp, and his heart full of thanks. Max Lucado says this, we'd be wise to do the same. We've much in common with Rickenbacker. We too were saved by a sacrificial visitor. We too were rescued by one who journeyed far from only God knows where. And we, like the captain, have every reason to look into the sky and worship with a heart of gratitude. Pray with me, please. Lord God, thank you for your mercy and your grace and your faithfulness and your love and your compassion and your goodness and your provision. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the privilege and the gift of life, the opportunity to serve you. Lord, we love you. And would you increase our capacity, Lord, for gratefulness. We pray this in your precious and majestic name.